Heavenly Father, what a remarkable thing it is that you, the uncontainable, would locate yourself in human flesh inside the universe on this tiny planet in a human body and experience the frailty, the weakness of humanity, though without sin, to suffer amongst us, to dwell with us. We thank you that you have done such a thing, such a shocking thing, that we who were rebels against you might become your children. This love is unfathomable. Your compassion, your mercy for us in a desperate state and in dire need just draws us in affections to you. We love you because you first loved us. Lord, we thank you that we can come to your word and as we do so, we ask for your help. We pray that you would grant power by your Holy Spirit for soft ears and soft hearts, uh, that we might be brought into conformity with your word and with your ways. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning is the third installment of our series, Caring for Each Other in the Body of Christ. And I have a slide for you giving our roadmap for this series. This is number three, your heart for spiritual restoration. And I want you to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter six, and we'll be looking at the first three verses of Galatians six together. Here, God has written through the apostle Paul these words, brethren, Even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We have seen our need to be together in Ephesians 4.16. The body causes the growth of the body with the proper working of each individual part, and those parts join together in vitality, which produces spiritual growth for the whole. We've asked the question, am I my brother's keeper? And we've seen from Hebrews chapter 10 that, yes, indeed, we are responsible for the spiritual care and welfare of each other. And this morning, what we're looking at in Galatians 6 is what it means to care for one another when we find ourselves in sin, when we find a brother or sister in Christ in sin. And Galatians 6 is a wonderful place for us to look at this reality. You and I need to have a heart that is ready for such circumstances. Look at verse 1 of Galatians 6, brethren. If anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. The situation here is a brother is caught in a trespass. And the word caught here is an interesting one. It's an illustrative word. Caught here is to be taken by surprise. There is some debate about who's doing the surprising, who's doing the catching. Some have surmised that... A brother is in sin and and someone is lurking, waiting around the corner, sort of hiding in the bushes, spying as it were, just waiting for somebody to falter, waiting for somebody to fail, and maybe even setting a trap for one to trip up. And as soon as that brother falters, we leap out of the bushes and say, aha, I caught you. I don't believe that is the picture here in Galatians 6. The picture rather is one is overtaken by surprise, not by the one spying out a life, but by the sin. This is what Paul says, if anyone is caught in or by any trespass. And we need to imagine for a moment that you're walking down the trail in the woods and in the distance you hear a groaning, an agonized 
painful groaning. And walking down the trail with some curiosity, you are shocked to discover it is your brother. And he is writhing on the ground. You see his leg has been caught in one of those old steel bear traps with the sharp teeth. The rusty kind set in the woods by some hunter's attempt to catch a bear. It has caught your brother instead. And the steel trap has snapped on his leg. And both bones in his lower leg are broken and the bone fragments are protruding through the skin. It is a compound fracture and there is blood on the ground and your brother cannot get himself out of the trap. What will you do? What must you do? No doubt you would jump in and and put your hands inside that trap and, and attempt to release the spring and then Carefully remove your brother's leg from that trap and take him off to the side to safety and begin to mend his wounds and search for care. You would tenderly, compassionately care for your brother. I think that is the picture described here in Galatians 6, 1 to 3. A trespass here is not a steel bear trap in the woods. It is a violation of God's command. In fact, trespass is the word used for sin in Romans 5.15. Adam's trespass was what plunged all of humanity into the corruption under which we now suffer. And so now because of that one transgression, that trespass, that going against God's law, we all sin out of our own nature. A trespass is a careening off of the path of what is right. It is driving the car into the ditch. Caught here is an interesting word to describe such a thing. To be overtaken by surprise, by a trespass. Sin is the one doing the catching. It it means to overpower before one can escape. And yet that sinning brother who is caught by any trespass is not an innocent victim. He's culpable. He is guilty before the Lord. He is a perpetrator, and now he is mangled in the consequences of his sin. And here in Galatians 6.1, any sin, it means not a specific sin or some specific kind of sin, and any one is not specific. The context will make it clear to us that this is any one of, of a follower of Christ, any believer. And the if is a condition Paul is not saying that this has happened, but if it does, you are to do this. The if part of the statement is not assumed to be true. It's just if such a circumstance should arise, then there is an imperative for believers. What is that imperative? What is the command here? Restore such a one. That is when you discover that your brother or sister is caught in some trespass, The obligation as a believer is to restore him, to bring him back to a restored state, to make whole that which is broken. What we want to look at this morning is the question, what kind of people must we be to do such business? What must the condition of our heart be to jump in and help in such a time of need? This morning, we're going to point out from Galatians 6, 1 to 3, nine characteristics of a heart well prepared to help a brother caught in sin. You see, we must be qualified to meet this need. And the nine characteristics unfolded in this section depict a heart that is well prepared to meet such a serious need. The first characteristic of a heart well-prepared is to be affectionate, to be affectionate. Notice how verse 1 starts, brethren, brothers. This is a word of fond affections. It is a word describing brotherly love. It is a family bond in the body of Christ. This is to be an unbreakable tie. You cannot unbrother somebody. The idea here is that we see one another as close-knit Like family relations are to be close-knit. This is an unbreakable tie, and it ought to be marked by warm affections. Second characteristic is also found in verse 1. Brothers, 
Even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. What is the second characteristic of a heart well prepared to jump in and help when someone is caught in sin? You must be spiritual. What does Paul mean by you who are spiritual? Well, back up to Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons, Paul writes, God has sent forth the Spirit, capital S Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is a reference to the indwelling Holy Spirit who is a person. He is a Trinitarian person, fully God, who indwells believers permanently from the point of salvation. And this Holy Spirit in us is also called the spirit of adoption. And he cries out with our spirits, according to Romans 8, that we are indeed children of God. It is the Holy Spirit who causes us to be born again, who conforms us into the image of God's Son, 2 Corinthians 3.18, who is concerned for holiness in us and who empowers us for service, who gifts every believer with spiritual gifts for use in the church, and who expresses the subjective impression of our filial relationship to God. That is, I'm a son, he's my daddy. The Holy Spirit produces that in the heart of a genuine believer. So at the very bottom, to be spiritual is to be one who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That is the baseline, but Paul means more than that in being spiritual. He unfolds this idea in Galatians 5, verses 14 to 26. Again, I'm going to read this section for us in its entirety because it is the context in which Paul says, you who are spiritual. What would his readers be thinking of but the paragraph that immediately precedes that talks about what being spiritual actually means? So follow along with me beginning in verse 14. The whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit sets its desire against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. What does it mean to be spiritual in this context? Spirit controlled, governed by the Holy Spirit, experienced in putting to death the deeds of the flesh by the leading of the Spirit. It is to be mature, to be a strong believer. Notice Paul does not lay this burden on pastors, deacons, small group leaders, or some Christian elite, but spiritual Christians, normal Christians, those being governed by the Holy Spirit in them. Now, consider by contrast, if someone set out to address someone else's sin, but they were marked by verse 17, the flesh, which is opposed to. To the spirit. The residual depravity in the life of a believer sets itself against the things that are of concern to the Holy Spirit in the believer. And so if you're being governed by fleshly thoughts and desires and behaviors and motivations, what kind of help would you be to a brother in need? You're in no place to assist someone caught in sin. If you were characterized, for instance, by verses 19 to 21, the deeds of the flesh, 
immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. What good are you for a brother brother trapped in the consequences of his sin? Not prepared, not in a good place. To step into the life of someone in need of correction and help while being impatient or bitter or arrogant. Frankly, the bottom line in all of these things is simply being selfish. Well, that is proof that you're not so spiritual as you may have thought. Can a flesh-governed disposition possibly carry on such delicate work as is required for helping a brother extricate himself from the dangers of sin. And there are some who believe that they have the gift, perhaps, of pointing out other people's faults. That's not one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit listed. That's not a job description handed out in the church. That's not one of the official positions available in a ministry. To think of yourself that way is to misunderstand the work. If, however, you are walking by the Spirit, verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. And if you are bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you, which is, verse 22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, you will be well-equipped to help a brother in need. You will be well positioned to help a beloved brother or sister get out of the ditch, to escape the steel bear trap, to get out of the peril and misery of some sin. There's a third characteristic required of a heart well prepared to help, and that is a heart of restoration. We must think restoratively. Again, look at verse 1. This is the lead command in this passage, restore such a one. This is a command. This is the expectation of Jesus as we care for one another in the body of Christ. Let me tell you what restore does not mean. It does not mean expel. I want nothing to do with you. Get out of my sight. It does not mean gossip about. It does not mean shame. It does not mean to respond in shock and horror and revulsion. It does not mean to delight or taunt or glory in another man's sin. And it does not mean to leave him to suffer or to leave him in danger. In industry, in the ancient world, this word for restoration uh, was used for the fixing of broken things. It's used in Matthew 4.21 for the mending of broken nets. After the fishermen got back to shore after a day's fishing, they sat and mended their nets on the beach. That's the same word for restore here. In the medical world, in ancient Greek, it it meant to set a bone. If a bone was broken, to set it straight, to put it back together. Or to reset a joint that was out of place. A dislocated shoulder needed to be put back in its place. This is the word that was used. This word here refers to sympathetic and timely care. There are nurses who make their profession in wound care, and that's not for everybody. It requires a strong stomach, a remarkable expertise, skilled hands, and a compassionate disposition. The sight of your brother in sin could promote revulsion and a lack of sympathy. How could you? And such a response to another man's sin would be an immature response, an arrogant response. The goal in addressing the sin of a brother in Christ is restoration. That is the goal. Not to puff oneself up by contrast, and not to be indifferent. The goal is to make the man spiritually whole, to get the car out of the ditch and drivable again. To get your brother out of the bear trap, to carefully tend to his wounds, to see him walking. No, not just walking, but skipping down the trail, running the Christian race again. Consider Paul's own heart for restoration. We'll get to this in a few weeks, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 
we have what we might call step five of the church discipline process. You may recall that in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul rebuked the Corinthian church for not practicing Matthew 18 and the church discipline process. How do you care for a brother when he will not turn from his sin? And Paul said, you haven't done this. You need to expel the immoral brother. And then when that man repents, Paul's charge to the Corinthian church is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And he says in verse 6, sufficient for that one is the punishment already inflicted by the majority. On the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Therefore, I urge you, reaffirm your love for him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. For the one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. There's a lot at stake in the completion of the church discipline process when the brother repents and he is to be welcomed back with open arms and a party and love. And again, we'll cover that in a few weeks. But I just want you to understand Paul's heart here. In how we address one another in sin, his heart is one of restoration. And that's how we must be prepared to address others. Think about Paul's uh, address in Philemon. You remember the story of Philemon. It is a letter Paul writes to, to one who had a disobedient slave who probably pilfered and stole. Paul knew Onesimus' wrongdoings. But this one had been purchased by the blood of Christ, had been forgiven of his sins by God. And and God, who is infinitely more offended than any human could ever be offended by a horizontal sin, forgave and made him a child and useful. And Paul's plea to Philemon is, forgive him, embrace him as a brother, not a slave. You just hear Paul's heart in all of these things as a heart of restoration, even when wrongs have been done, especially when wrongs have been done. Paul's is one of fatherly concern, motherly tenderness, brotherly affection, and compassionate care. That ought to be our heart. A fourth characteristic, our hearts must be gentle. Again, look at verse 1. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. That simply means with a gentle spirit. One element of the multifaceted fruit of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is gentleness. And the word here means to not be overly impressed with a sense of your own importance, such that you respond to someone else with harshness. To not do that is to be meek, to be gentle. To have a view of your own self that results in a humility towards others. In this context, your focus is not on you, but on the pressing need of your brother in his distressed state. It means you can't respond to him in anger or impatience or with arrogance. You cannot be distant. You cannot be harsh or rough in your dealings. But you must get close And be patient and be gentle. This reflects the dealings of God with sinners. Sinners who look to God from a distressed state and simple faith. What is God's response? The bruised reed he will not break. Isaiah 42.3 Yahweh sustains all who fall and he raises up all who are bowed down. Psalm 145.14 What is God's heart to those who in their distress, in their misery, in their sin and rebellion and the consequences of it, look to him in simple faith? Gentleness, tenderness, kindness, mercy, forgiveness, help, transformation. This is the heart of God for those in need. This ought to be our heart as well sensitive to sin. We're aware of its dangers. We take it seriously. We don't make light of it and full of grace, eager to help those caught in it. 
a fifth characteristic. We must be introspective. We must be introspective. Notice what Paul says at the end of verse 1. Each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. Each one looking to yourself is a dramatic change from plural nouns to singular ones. It's emphatic in the original. This individualizes this characteristic. It brings to the critical importance that each one of us look at our own lives. Look at our own hearts to scope yourselves. The word scope comes from the Greek word here. To examine yourself carefully. One older writer said this, There is no part of Christian duty which requires us to look more carefully to our own spirit than administering reproof to our brothers. And the more we are impressed with a sense of our own weakness and proneness to fall, the better shall we be able to hold up our brother when he stumbles. And listen, we usually get this backwards. When we sin, we make excuses, blame shift, make light of it. Oh, it's no big deal. If everybody understood where I was coming from, they wouldn't think it was a big deal either. We excuse ourselves and we demand a pound of flesh from others. And that is completely backwards. If only we could seek to be understanding of others and not let our own hearts off the hook so easily. John Bradford was a pastor in London in the 1550s, that is, under the reign of Bloody Mary. She was an upstart regent and a committed Catholic. She was determined to stamp out the Bible in England and to bring to an end the Protestant Reformation there. There were many who were burned at the stake under Bloody Mary. July 1st, 1555 was the home going of John Bradford. He was burned at the stake at Smithfield in London. His execution was scheduled for 4 a.m. The government wanted to sort of keep it under wraps and not bring a lot of attention to it. But crowds showed up at 4 a.m. because John Bradford was well-loved. Before the fire was lit, he begged forgiveness of any he had wronged, and he offered forgiveness to those who had wronged him. He then turned to John Leaf, with whom he was being burned to death, and he said, Be of good cheer, brother, for we shall have a merry supper with the Lord this night. It was said of John Bradford that he went to the stake as one going to his wedding day. In fact, uh, one woman who had been Uh, profoundly affected by his preaching and teaching, had knit for him a special shirt, a wedding shirt, to go to his burning. John Bradford was a humble man. He had a diary that served as a catalog of his own sins. He would write them down. He would examine himself and, and think through not only the things that, could, that people could see on the outside, but the motives on the inside that drove them, the idolatries of the heart that were underneath them, the roots of unbelief that undergirded all of those outward behaviors. People really couldn't point to John Bradford's outward life and cry villainy or some scandalous thing, but he knew his heart. And he wrote them down, and, and he wrote down the, in these catalogs of sin, uh, not only what they were, what the Bible described them as, but also his Holy Spirit produced repentances from them. What would it take to turn from this sin and turn Christward? And what that produced in John Bradford's life was the, what has now become a famous phrase in the English language, but for the grace of God, there go I. The quote from John Bradford is accredited to him as walking down the street. Some say as he would walk down the street any time of day and see some drunkard or some profligate on the side of the road in the the curb just laying by the wayside. And he would say, but for the grace of God, there goes John Bradford. Some say that he even said that on his way to the stake where he was killed, burnt alive even saying such things of those who had accused him and those who escorted him in arms and those who started the fire. That is a good, humble preparation for dealing with the sins of others. That must be characteristic of our hearts, looking to ourselves. 
We must also be wary. Notice the end of verse 1. So that you too will not be tempted. We must have some situational awareness. We are yet sinners. We still face residual depravity in us. We can't blame our sins on something outside of us. These things come from the heart. And until we are in glory with Christ, we will not be perfected. So there is the residue of our old life, and this produces in us sins. This produces a ready situation for temptations. And Galatians 6.1 does not tell us what we might be tempted toward. Paul leaves it ambiguous. Nothing is stated. We could be tempted towards the same sin as our brother. Hey, I like steel bear traps. Can I put my foot in there? See what happens? Or maybe we're tempted towards pride, the superiority that says, I would never do that. How could you? You should know better. Steel bear traps. We could be tempted towards the pride of invulnerability. Oh, I'm, I'm not susceptible to such things. And yet succumb to any other temptation. In fact, the areas that are a trap for you may not be a temptation at all for your brother whom you scorn. And we are all of various sorts, tempted and tried by various things. We're not exactly like each other. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul warns, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. This is a ready reality. Martin Luther said, I may fall more dangerously and more shamefully than he did. If they who are so ready to judge and condemn others would consider their own sins, they should find the sins of others who are fallen to be but specks and their own sins to be great beams. Listen, because of indwelling sin in every believer, because of our great enemy, he's a prowling ravenous lion seeking someone to devour. Because of the world around us, that anti-God system under satanic deception and satanic direction. And because of the prevalence of temptations every day around us. Any one of us could sin in just about any way, given the right circumstances, given a lack of vigilance in prayer, a faltering independence on the Lord, a failure to benefit from life together in the church, a waning disciplines in Bible intake, any of us could falter, and we would then be in need of spiritual restoration or in danger of apostasy itself. So we look to ourselves, lest any of us be tempted. A seventh characteristic is strength. Your heart must be strong for these things, Christian. Notice verse 2, bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. No, I, I thought the Christian life was just supposed to be easy. I, I thought Jesus just wanted to get into my life to make it more comfortable and friendly and fun. The Christian life involves bearing one another's burdens. And one another here makes it explicit that we are talking about Christians. Not sinners in general, but Christians when they sin. And the one another here uh, removes from us the idea that we have this attitude towards people like false teachers. Or those who have no claim on Christ that would infiltrate the church. Or those with a, a stubbornness in sin will not turn from their sin at all and must be treated as outsiders. Those aren't the categories of people described here. This is internal. This is about our attitude towards Christians. We're not talking about those who continue in sin. If your brother says, for instance, hey, I'm not in a bear trap, when he clearly is, his bones are poking out of his skin, he's bleeding, he can't get himself out, and his life is ebbing away before your very eyes, and he's saying, I'm not stuck, I'm fine. What do you do in that case? Well, we'll get to that in two weeks. You, you go get another brother. And, and you try to help your brother see. You try to help your brother turn. This means uh, the bearing of each other's burdens uh, it does not mean we flatter idolatries. Ah, bear traps are no big deal. 
It's going to ruin your life, but hey, we've all got those. It doesn't mean we ignore harmful ideologies. Somebody believes harmful untruths or teaches them or disciples others in them. We, we don't leave them there. And we certainly don't leave our brothers snared in life-destroying behaviors. We're talking here about the brother overtaken by sin who needs and desires help from you to set things right. And the command is clear, bear one another's burdens. That is, shoulder the weight. Paul does not say bear with them, as in tolerate. Let's just let bygones be bygones. You know, you're groaning in the woods. Could you keep it down a little bit? No, actually get in there and help. Give real assistance. To bear the burden means to carry the weight. To jump in, endure the cost. A cost in time, in effort, potential injury, discomfort. It means to give real and timely assistance to your brother in need. Wound care is a burden. It is a matter of selfless service. It requires strong shoulders and skilled hands and a tender touch. And you might be tempted to say, well, you know, that's not my business. I mean, these are private concerns. I don't want anybody all up in my business about such things, so I'm just going to, you know, let them be private. That is not the way of Christ. You might, with a tender conscience, say, who am I to talk to someone else about their sin? I mean, I sin. Yes. God is enjoining Christians to help other Christians. The only people in that category are sinners who have needed help, who need help regularly, and who must help each other. And do so in some very particular ways. We are all to carry burdens. You are your brother's keeper. This is one another help. It is reflexive, mutual sympathy, mutual care. And the kind of care that's required here is not cheap words, not well-wishing, not, I hope that works out for you, brother. (laughs) Better him than me. It's not, be warmed and filled and depart. This takes work. Christian, it means you need to know your Bible, and you might have to do some homework. What does the Bible say about these sins? What does the Bible say about turning from these things? What would it mean to put off these behaviors and put on behaviors that are pleasing to the Lord? What, it would, what would it mean to turn 180 degrees from this sin and put these deeds of the flesh to death and put on righteousness? What would it mean to walk with Christ in humble faith and obedience? And sometimes we need to hold each other's hands and walk each other through these things. I have been the beneficiary of this from people in my life over and over again. And we need each other in these things. And it's not easy. Sometimes I'm not easy. It's a burden. It requires strong hearts. Strengthened in the knowledge of God's word. Strengthened in the skill that it takes to bring God's word to bear on specific situations. And compassion. There's an eighth characteristic required of us, and it is obedience. Look at the second half of verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Fulfill the law of Christ. These two ideas are connected, bearing one another's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. You see, bearing one another's burdens does something, according to verse 2. Bear one another's burdens is a broader statement than what's in verse 1. Verse 1 is a specific application of bearing burdens in the body of Christ. Bearing burdens when someone is caught in sin. But there are other kinds of bearing burdens that are necessary for us. Help in trials, comfort in sorrows, speaking truth into one another's lives, etc. And here in verse 2, the broad command is given, of which verse 1 is an example. But shouldering each other's burdens does something. What is that something? According to verse 2, it fulfills the law of Christ. Now, this is the only time in the New Testament or the Bible that the phrase law of Christ is used. It's an interesting phrase to talk about law and Christ is to speak of love and holiness and that on a vertical and a horizontal plane. That is, we are to love God and be obedient to him and we are to love others in obedience to him. 
The idea of law here is that which regulates, that which comes into our lives and regulates our behavior. It means something we must do. We are to live up to the expectation of the lawgiver, and our lives are to be regulated by Jesus the Christ. And this command here fits with the greatest commands described elsewhere in the Bible. Love God and love your neighbor. Here, love your brother in the body of Christ. If I love Christ, I must love what he loves, and I must love what is his. This brother caught in sin belongs to my Savior, whom I say I love. Therefore, I can't pretend sin is no big deal. Jesus does not love sin. And I must recognize that the commands of Jesus for the Christian life are good. They are good intrinsically because commands from Jesus reveal his character, and they are good experientially because following them results in vibrant and effective spiritual life. And if I love my brother, I cannot leave him to struggle, to suffer in his misery, stifled in uselessness, in spiritual peril. He is a danger to himself and a danger to others. Again, this is hard work. This is a burden to carry. It would be much easier to be indifferent or arrogant, to walk on by. But that is not love. That is selfishness. Bearing one another's burdens, according to Galatians 6.2, fulfills the law of Christ. Because it is shorthand for love God that is obedient to his commands and love my brother. In caring for each other in this way, we are doing what Jesus wants of us. Now, this is very interesting language in the letter to the Galatians. You may recall that this letter is a rebuke, a stinging rebuke of legalism. It begins with no greeting. It's unlike the other of Paul's letters. It really starts out with this question, who has bewitched you? Galatians, are you crazy? You started out under the banner of the grace of God. And you've gone back to legal things, to precepts, to outward externals to sort of a bootstrap human religion. You think you can please God and judge others by what you do. That is not the grace of God. That is not the Christian life. Matt mentioned the Judaizers pressing circumcision from the communion meditation this morning. The Judaizers were putting the burden of Mosaic law upon New Testament Christians as if they had to keep Mosaic law to be pleasing to God. Or they would put up Mosaic law as a barrier for those who didn't. Or as a judgment for those who couldn't conform by their own external standards. It was an obsolete law, misapplied to followers of Jesus, laid down as an unbearable burden on the Christian life. The letter to the Galatians is a rebuke of all of this. Paul turns the language of the Judaizers On its head in verse 2. Listen, bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. He's been talking about law and burden for the whole letter of Galatians. You want law? I'll give you law. The law of Christ. You want a burden? You want a burden you, you can't even lift, but you act like it? And you want to put it on other people to assess their outward conformity? No, that's not the burden you need to be thinking of. Here's the burden. Love your brother. Shoulder his burden. Don't burden yourselves with regulations God has not given you so as to impress each other with your self-righteousness. Rather, burden yourselves with actual critical care for each other. By so doing, you will fulfill the law of Christ. It's a remarkable and shocking turn in this book. It leads us to a ninth characteristic we must have in addressing one another when caught in sin. Humility. We must have humble hearts. Look at verse 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. This verse is an explanation. It's not an explanation of verse 2. It's actually an explanation of the second half of verse 1. Go back up to verse 1. Restore in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so you will not be tempted. Verse 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. 
this explanation demands a right assessment of ourselves. Humility. Sometimes it demands dihydrosoxide. Pardon me. Look at the end of chapter 5, verse 26. Remember Paul's description we just walked through of what it means to walk by the Spirit, to be Spirit-controlled, Spirit-governed. It ends with this command, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Boastful here is vainglory, personal arrogance. How does that vainglory manifest itself, challenging each other, envying one another? Uh, if that guy seems to be above me or beyond me, I, I want what he has. I, I want the esteem that he has. I, I want the position that he has. I want people to look at me the way they look at that guy. And so boasting would be tearing one another down, building oneself up at the expense of others. And so you who are spiritual restore is a contrast to that fleshly vainglory, that boasting that results in challenging and envying. And the contrast here is in verse 3, if you think you're something when you're nothing, you deceive yourself. And Paul puts it to us in a striking way. Uh, I'll give you kind of a, a clunky translation from the original. If any perceives himself to be something, nothing being, he deceives himself. And the original here, something and nothing are right next to each other in the word order of the sentence. And it's striking. It's emphatic. If you think you're something, nothing you are. You're nothing. And if you think yourself to be something, it's a deception. This is not hyperbole here. Paul is not exaggerating. This is sobriety. This is a right assessment of the situation. What does he mean here? Listen, any good that is in a Christian is Christ. Any attainment to Christian maturity is grace. You brought nothing into the Christian life except your own sin, believer. Listen, if left to my own devices, I would sell out. I would deny Christ. I would wash out, cash it in, walk away and fall apart. We are truly dependent for all things in the Christian life, dependent on his grace, dependent on his power, the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We are needy. We must acknowledge it. We are nothing in and of ourselves. We will and we do according to his power, which mightily works within us. Listen, a high view of yourself will result in indifference about your brother's plight. I don't care. I got more important things to do. I'm walking down this trail. I can't be bothered with such things. A high view of self will result in independence. I don't need him. I don't need anybody. I'm never going to falter like that. I can do this on my own. And a high view of self will cause you to believe you are impervious. I won't falter. I won't slip. This is all self-deception. Whether willful or unwitting, we are deceived if we think these things. Notice the text does not say, if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he tricks God. God's not deceived. The text doesn't say you deceive others. In fact, others may see it quite plainly. The truth is you deceive yourself. The commentator John Brown wrote, if a man feeds his self-deceit by glorying over the supposed or real inferiority of others, he proves himself destitute of the heart of love. And then he quotes 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge and I, have not, and I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. 
And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Calvin was right when he said, whatever be our acuteness in detecting the faults of others, we're backwards on our own. Martin Luther said, we stand on slippery ground. If we grow proud, there is nothing so easy to us as falling. How did Paul view his own Christian life? Ephesians 3.8, he called himself the very least of all the saints. So Paul addressed sin and others. He wrote letters of rebuke. He still considered himself the least of all the saints. How did Paul refer to himself in 1 Timothy 1.15? The chief of all sinners. That's not a looking back at his pre-Christian days. Present tense verb there. And just prior to listing himself as the chief of sinners, he listed a whole long line of terrible, dirty deeds. How did Paul view himself? A sinner, saved by grace. Listen to how Jesus said we should view ourselves, Luke 17, 10. This is the one who called us friends and brothers, said this is how we should think of ourselves. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say this, we are unworthy slaves. We have only done that which we ought to have done. That is the perspective we must have. That is the heart preparation we must do to be ready to help others in a time of need, particularly the need of being caught in any trespass. Are you ready? Are you ready to help a sister in Christ in a time of such need? Are you preparing your own heart to be of service for critical care? To help a brother up when he's overtaken by some sin? Flip that around a moment. Are you ready to be helped, Christian? Are you overtaken even now? Even here this morning. Are you ready to be assisted? To have an imperfect. Sinner saved by grace. Jump in in your time of need. And get around your broken legs. And pry open a steel bear trap. And move you. Look. that That's not comfortable. That's not easy. You're. Your sister in Christ isn't going to do that perfectly. You hope that they are prepared with nine heart characteristics. But are you ready to be helped? Do you see what you're in as sin? As a mess? As displeasing to God, grieving the Holy Spirit within And causing you personal peril, rendering you useless in the race that God has set before you. Or even as we have talked about in this series, perhaps a pathway to discovery that you don't love Christ at all. And are in eternal peril. Are you ready to be helped? Are you resistant to spiritual help? Do you recognize your need? Or are you content with crippling injury and comfortable with mortal spiritual danger? Maybe you're here this morning and you recognize that you are not spiritual, not in the sense that Paul means right here at the beginning of Galatians 6. You're not prepared. You're you're not mature. You're not experienced. You're not wise enough to help a brother or sister in Christ extricate himself from peril. Well, let me give you some encouragement this morning. Get there. We need you. This is the task for all believers. Walk by the Spirit. Do not walk in vain glory. Help your brother. Bear his burdens. Fulfill the law of Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize that you are not a Christian at all. To my right is a prayer room. After we sing a closing song and have a closing prayer, there will be some sweet friends there at the door ready to meet you. 
If you want to know for the first time what it means to have your sins forgiven, to be declared righteous by God on the basis of Jesus' finished work at the cross, and to enter into new life for the first time, to have a guarantee of heaven and new power within, these friends here would love to tell you how you can do just that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your tender care for us, that you look down in our misery, in our time of need, in our helplessness and hopelessness, and you rescued. May we, O oh God, as your followers, have your heart. May we be prepared of heart to be an instrument in your hands for the rescue of our brothers and sisters. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.